Hi and welcome to this video. Today we start talking about travel demand and traffic forecasting. So if you think about it, in previous classes we talked about traffic demand or analysis flow rate in uh, freeway analysis, in signalized intersection analysis, and uh, we didn't talk about where these values come from but in this chapter we will learn how to predict traffic demand on a transportation network and on a transportation link following a certain procedures that we'll be talking about i would like to uh, start the conversation by asking you to think about some of the reasons that may lead to some changes in traffic volumes or traffic demand and there is a difference between demand and volume but for now i'm, I'm going to use them interchangeably so think about what are what are some of the things that are going to influence the volume that you're going to see on a travel on a, on, a, on, a, on a transportation link so here are some that i have listed here one is changes in economic activity. So if economic activity at a region is growing and it's attracting more people to work or to bring goods uh, or things like that, you expect to see more traffic demand and eventually more traffic volume on transportation links that are going towards that special region. Also, one of the things that is going to influence travel demand is a traveler's preferences and travel pattern. Think about yourself. Your preference in selecting the route, selecting the time that you want to make the travel, whether or not you want to make that travel, uh, what kind of transportation mode you want to use you want to use your own car do you want to walk do you want to use the bus system all of those are gonna influence the volume that we have on trans uh, we have on our transportation links a traveler's social or recreational activities also is going to influence the traffic demand that we have like if you are very socially or recreationally active you go to different parks bars to museums so you're going to influence or you're going to change traffic demand compared to another traveler that maybe is interested only in sporting events and goes to let's say watching basketball or football games and not other activities or someone that is interested in those and not in other things okay also if you make any modification to highway network that is gonna influence traffic demand on other links why because the traffic is gonna change uh, when when you when you for example close a transportation link that is not going to be used so the 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 traff the traffic or the trips that were supposed to use that link are going to be now redistributed in other transportation link and you're going to see an increase in transportation in, in traffic volume <coughs> excuse me in traffic volume in other links so if you think about the time several years back in raleigh area when uh, interstate 40 was uh, being uh, paved and lanes were added and things like that at a lot of times only two or three lanes were open on interested 40 and as a result of that we were experiencing a lot of congestion on other arterial streets corridors in the raleigh area that usually we don't see that now when we forecast vehicle traffic a few things we do one of the things that we do is that we want to find out uh, that what is the overall growth or decline in a region's traffic 
For example, if you think about Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill area, that's the region. And one of the things that transportation engineers want to know is that in five years from now, is the traffic demand the same? Is it gonna go up or is it gonna go down? And the reason that we know we, we need to know this is that we want to be able to prepare for what is gonna come in the future from now. We also forecast traffic because we want to be able to propose detours or traffic diversions to, 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 to the public when we are going to close a road or when something happens and there is a need to move um, people from one area to the other area. So now I want for a few minutes to focus on uh, the decisions that a traveler is going to make and uh, to, to make a trip and uh, those decisions as we discussed in the previous slide is going to change or in a way determine the quantity, the spatial distribution and temporal distribution of vehicles on a vehicle node on a vehicle network. So it's going to tell us how many vehicles are going to be on which link at what time. So what are the decisions that a traveler is going to make? Now I want you to think about what you would do when you want to leave home to school or you want to leave school to home. So for me, the first decision is that, do I want to go or not? If I have a class, I have to go. If I have something that's happening, I have to go. But if that is, if, if you have the option for a travel, for instance, decision is that, do I want to go or not? If you want to go, what time do I want to go? And a lot of times that is dictated by the time that you have to be there. So you know what time you need to be there. You have a good expectation, hopefully, from how much time it's going to take you to get there. And based on those, you're going to say that, OK, I need to be there at 8.30. It's going to take me 15 minutes. And so I want to leave at 8.15, 8.10 to make sure that I'm there on time. And in, in that estimation of time, in a way, you're accounting for how you're going to travel there. Are you going to walk? Are you going to take the bus? Or are you going to take your car? So there is a lot of things that you are making uh, your mind about them before you go. So uh, if we want to pretty much group these decisions that you make, some of these decisions are temporal decisions. That's the decision whether or not to travel and what time or when to travel. You make some decisions about your destination, where you want to go, and you don't make that decision about all types of travel. For example, if you have to go to school, you have to go to, to school. Or if you're going back to home, you're going back to home, the decision is set. But let's say you want to buy something. Now you can make a decision about the destination. Do I want to go to Food Lion here, Food Lion there, or do I want to go to a Walmart here or somewhere else? So now the decision, the decision that you're making and the destination that you're going to select all of a sudden becomes a decision that you're making. Okay? Modal decision. How do you want to get there? Do you want to take the bus? Do you want to drive? Do you want to walk? Do you want to take your bicycle or any other form of transportation? And the last group is spatial decisions. And that's really what route you will be taking to get from your origin to your destination. Are you going to take the Western Boulevard or are you going to take the Hillsborough Street or any other road to get there? Okay, so that's spatial decisions that you and I as a traveler are going to make even without knowing 
we are making all of these decisions that you see here when we make a travel or ma when we make a trip. Okay, let's continue the conversation that we have had in the previous slide a little bit in this slide. And here, uh, what you see is pretty much a graph that shows how different things interact with each other and eventually uh, they lead to the traffic that we observe in our highway system. So here uh, we, we eventually move to the highway system, but you would see that I have three boxes uh, that um, are interacting with each other. And by those, I mean this box, this box, and this box. So these are travelers uh, socioeconomics and activity pattern we talked about that a little bit before and those are going to influence what you see in the in the box in the middle and there what is happening in that box is that a traveler is going to decide to travel is going to select uh, the travel mode and assuming that that travel mode is using the highway system then we are going to get what is the traffic on different links so let's focus on on the on the, on the big box inside so decision to travel is gonna be influenced by availability of different modes of transportation and also residential and commercial uh, developments in the area so if there are means for you to travel so there is a higher chance for you to travel especially if you need to go to a distance and also the residential and commercial development may developments may be rather than the need to travel from one side of the city to the other side uh, if things are uh, not available in your neighborhood maybe you decide not to do so or if things are available maybe you just decide to make a short trip to to the neighborhood uh, now when those decisions are being made you also think about how you want to get there are you going to go with uh, your car bus or how you're going to get there and that availability of other modes is one uh, factor that is going to contribute to to what you're going to change also the level of service that those modes are providing you are going to influence your decision so if it's the let's say most comfortable to get there with your car and by most comfortable i mean both comf comfort i mean cost i mean travel time then you probably select your car but if you're going to let's say downtown manhattan it's hard to park it's hard to park um, it's going to take you a lot of time to drive your own car there but the alternative is taking the subway it's not too expensive maybe it's not the most comfortable thing but it's going to take you to where you want to go very fast and it provides you a good level of service you're going to go with that so assuming that you go with highway system then the next decision that you're going to make is how you want to get to your destination now maybe uh, you want to let's say go from uh, our campus to Durham so you have a few options you can take I-40 to get there you can get uh, you can take US 70 to go there now you're going to take think about how long each of these routes are you're going to think about how fast you can drive on each of the, them and eventually what kind of level of service they provide for you what is the travel time that you expect and you probably take the one that is going to give you the best level of service and if you think about all of these things the decision to make a trip eventually is going to influence the traffic that we have on the highway system and the traffic that we have on a highway system also is going to influence your decision to make the trip so if you look at this 
graph that I have here, it's pretty much showing you the same thing. So you make some decisions and the most important one is that do I want to make the trip or not? When I'm going to make it? How I'm going to make it? Which road or route I'm going to use? And those decisions are going to influence they're going to influence uh, traffic on highway system, on our bus systems, on uh, sidewalks and everything. But the decision to make the trip is based on the level of service that you have on highways, you have on bus system and everything. And you can see a loop there that these things influence one another. Okay. So on this slide, we are going to look at an overview of a sequential approach that we have to, traf to estimate traffic. So this approach has four different steps. And what we do or we have done in this course is that we have combined two of those steps together. So what you see here is an approach that has uh, three main uh, parts. The first part is trip generation. And that's the decision to make the trip or not. And when that decision is made, we have the origin of the trip, number of trips, and depart departure time of trips. The second decision uh, or step that you see here is mode and destination choice. And these are really two different steps, but they have been combined here. So mode or destination uh, is going to tell you that if the trip is going to be on highway or not, number of trips on highway and departure time on highway trip and destination of highway trip. And the last one is going to be highway route choice which routes or routes you're going to change when you're going through the system and that is going to give you eventually the traffic volume on each transportation link. So now I'm going to focus on trip generation. So what do we have here? We want to be able to predict exactly at what time a trip is made. So let's take a deeper look into what is happening. So here I'm showing you an example. Uh, you see that at different times there are decisions that have to be made. So for example, here at um, 6 a.m., And the person has decided that needs to leave the house for work. At 12 noon, there is a decision to leave work for lunch. A little bit later, maybe at uh, a little bit before 1 p.m., leave restaurant to return home, then leave work to return home, leave home to shop, leave shopping center to return home, leave home to visit friend, leave friend to return home. So you can see that these trips are, uh, these decisions are really happening at different times, right? And there is a wide variety, a uh, variety of trip types that you see here. So I have working trips, I have social recreational trip, I have shopping trips, and these different types of trips are are really hard to 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 um, predict them so to simplify the approach we make a few uh, aggregations so we aggregate decision making units rather than focusing on a person to make the trip, we are going to focus on a household to make a trip or a neighborhood. We also, rather than working on all of these trips together, we work on different trips based on their type. So work trips are going to be treated differently, recreational trips differently, shopping trips differently. 
we also aggregate the trips based on time so we are not really interested to know if you leave your home at 6 12 or 6 14 we want to know for example between 6 to 7 a.m how many trips are made from that household or from that neighborhood so we aggregate the time so that we are not looking at each of these trips separately so that brings me to a typical trip generation model that I'm showing you here. So let's talk a little bit about this equation that I have, and then we can uh, talk a little bit more here. Uh, I have Ti is equal to B0 plus Bi Z I plus B1 Z1 I plus B2 Z2 I and so forth. So what is Ti? Ti is the number of vehicle-based trip in this equation. It could be transit trips it could be uh, walking trips but here it's the number of vehicle based trips of a given type in a specified time period made by household i so household i is going to make ti trips in a pre-specified time for example household i is going to make five trips between 5 to 9 a.m. B's are coefficients that are estimated from traveler survey data, and each of them correspond to a specific characteristics. And when I show you an example, this is going to make a whole lot of a whole lot more sense. ZKI is that characteristics. For example, one characteristic could be income, employment in neighborhood. The other one could be number of household members. And those are the characteristics that we think are going to influence um, the number of trips. So how do we estimate Bs? We usually collect data from um, using surveys. We are going to interview people. We are going to ask how many trips they are making. We are going to ask about their income, uh, where they work, what kind of transportation they have access to. And then we use regression models to fit the best model that is going to predict the data. And when we do that, all of the Bs are going to be given to us. The model is going to give those to us. So let's take a look at an example, and this is going to help us understand what I was, what I have been talking about a little bit more. So we have a, let's assume that we have a simple linear regression model, and that model is going to estimate shopping trips during a shopping trip trip peak hour. The model is this: number of peak hour vehicle-based shopping trips per household is equal to 0.12 plus 0 0.09 into household size, plus 0 0.011 into annual household income in $1,000, minus 0.15 in employment in the household neighborhood. Okay, so if you think about it, what this tells you is that if the household size increases, the number of trips is going to increase. Why? Because household size has a positive coefficient. So if your household is one, is household size is one, we're going to make 0.12 plus 0.09 trips. If the household increased to two, you're going to make 0.12 plus 0.09 into two trips. If income is more, you're going to make more shopping trips, for example. And if there is a lot of employments in the neighborhood, then the number of shopping trips is, is less. So this is what is given to us. Not everything needs to make sense. Okay. Now, the question asks us that a household has six members. Household size is six. Their annual income is $50,000. So if you want to put it in the equation, you need to put 50 because it's in thousands of dollars. They currently live in a neighborhood with 450 retail employees, but are moving to a new neighborhood with 150 retail employees. Calculate the predicted number of vehicle-based peak hour trips 
the households are going to make before and after the move okay so if you think about before the move they have their income is 50k they have six people in the household and the number of employees in the area as for in the area is 450 in the new neighborhood the household size not is not going to change the income is not going to change it's the same but the employment is going to be 150. so we need to use this equation twice to find the number of peak hour vehicle based shopping tips so what I would like to do is to pause the video here, solve this problem, and then resume. Okay, so let's find out how many trips the household is going to make before the move. So number of vehicle trips is going to be equal to 0.12 plus 0.09 into household size, size which is 6, plus 0.011 into the annual income which is 50k here we put 50 minus 0.15 into uh, the number of employees <coughs> in the neighborhood expressed in 100 people so we have 450 people we are going to put 4.5 so the number of trips before the move is going to be 0.535 after the move everything is going to be the same except for this 4.5 is going to be reduced to 1.5 so that is going to give us more trips which is going to be equal to 0.985 so during the peak hour before the move the household is going to make 0.53 trips during the peak hour after the move they're going to make 0.985 trips during the peak hour of shopping trip so now my question is that is this something that is reasonable or not and you can think about what is not reasonable about the numbers that I have here 0.535 trips 0.985 trips what does a fractional number of trips mean So that will bring me to this slide so if you use a linear regression like what we did in the previous slide the number of trips could be a real number a linear regression model is going to give you 4.2 trips 0.75 trips but fractions of trips is not really realistic here so we need to think about a modeling approach that either gives us integer values or if that's not possible at least gives us the probability for making no trip one trip two trips three trips and so on so rather than a linear regression model what kind of model do you think i can use that is going to give me the probability of making no trip one trip two trips or more so if you think about what we covered in chapter five a poisson model was giving us the probability of having one vehicle to arrive during the certain time zero vehicles arrive during the certain time or five vehicles arrive during the, a certain time so it's pretty much the same thing so a poisson model could do that for us So if we revisit Poisson model for trip generation here, I'm going to have P of Ti. So P of Ti is going to be the probability that that household I is going to make exactly Ti trips. So that probability is not a real number. It is a real number. It's not an integer number. It's something between zero and one. But the number of trips is not fraction. It's not fraction anymore it's a it's a whole number so e is the base of the natural logarithm is 2.718 lambda i is the poisson model parameter uh, we had ways to determine it in chapter 5 here it's a little bit different 
So lambda i is going to be equal to e to the power of b z i. And what is b z i? It's b0 plus b1 i z1 i plus b2 i z2 i b3 i z3 i and so forth. So I'm going to show you an example and it's going to help you better understand what we have been talking here. So lambda i is a real number. It does not have to be an integer value. But when we apply it to the equation that we get, ti's are going to be integer value. Vector b is estimated by maximum likelihood procedures. that We don't cover them in this class, but you can go to the back of your book and there is some discussion there that helps you understand them better but it's pretty much the same approach data is collected regression analysis is done and based on that these coefficients are determined so let's look at this example so now let's assume that we are working on the same example but we have a poisson regression so BZI is equal to negative 0.35 plus 0.03 into household size plus 0.04 into annual household income minus 0.1 in employment. Uh, we want to know that what is the probability that the household will not make a peak hour trip and the household size is Six, the income is 50k and the employment is 150 people so we can pause the video here and then resume for the solution so let's start with the solution first thing that we need to do is to find the expected value of ti which is lambda i it's e to the power of bzi and bzi was given so i have e to the negative uh, e to the power of negative 0.35 plus 0.03 into household size plus 0.04 into the annual income minus 0.1 into the retail so that is going to give you a lambda i of 0.887 now the question was asking what is the probability of having no trips so that is equal to the prob probability of ti equal to zero or p of zero so it's going to be e to the negative lambda i into lambda i to the power of 0 over 0 factorial. Remember, 0 factorial is 1. So if we do that, you're going to get 0 0.412, and that's the probability of making no trips. Okay, here is a great place to pause, and we will continue the conversation in the next class. Have a good one.